A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Hi, this is Victoria Meyer. Welcome to The Chemical Show. This week, I am speaking with Martijn van Nordenen, who is the Senior Director of Industry Go-To-Market for Salesforce. Martin actually has a very long history in the chemical industry and spent a big part of his career at Shell Chemicals, which is where I got to know Martin. So we are going to be talking about commercial excellence, the customer experience, and more. Martin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Victoria. It's a pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. Glad to have you here. So let's just jump in and tell me, what is your origin story? How did you get started in the chemical industry? And then how did you take that leap from being in the industry directly to where you are today with Salesforce? So it depends a little bit how far back we want to go, Victoria. But if you go way back in my family history, fun fact that not many people know, but my granddad took over a firm from his dad, which was actually selling bleach. So that was the start of a small chemicals business that my father then succeeded my granddad in. And basically what they did was they bought these full truckloads, amongst others from Shell, for example, solvents, and then they repackaged that into smaller packaging and sold that to retailers across the Netherlands. Interesting. So that's my very first exposure to the chemicals world. And mind you, I then thought, hmm, not sure if this is an industry that I want to work in. Because, yeah, obviously there are health and safety issues or concerns, et cetera, around that. I then went through high school, dropped chemistry in third grade because I thought I couldn't calculate. Turns out that wasn't it. I just had to work a bit on it. Studied law, then worked in IT training for a while. And then I joined Shell. Initially not in chemicals, but my second job in Shell was in chemicals. And I guess the rest is history because I really fell in love with the industry and all the technology that's there. I always thought I liked information technology, but I found out in the chemicals industry that I like all technology. I love figuring out how a plant works and why if you put this molecule on this end, it comes out as another molecule on the other end. I find that fascinating. Yeah, it's a great industry for problem solvers. Absolutely, yeah. So then you transition to Salesforce. That seems like a big leap. Yeah, in a way. So for me, it felt more like going full circle. I always joked that I'm a geek at heart. And as I said before, I love technology. And this was for me a way to sort of rekindle with that interest that I've always had when it comes to computers and information technology. And that was actually the sector that I worked in before I joined Shell. But to tell you the truth, in my last role in Shell Chemicals, I was responsible for commercial excellence globally. And one of the things in my remit was the platforms that we use, the technology that we use to do our daily work in the commercial space. And by sheer luck, probably, I stumbled on this Salesforce technology. We did an implementation that extended quite broad, and I fell in love with the technology. And then when that time came that everybody goes through where... Well, there's a funny story behind that as well, but I won't tell that on the podcast about me and my (laughs) midlife crisis. So basically figuring out, I'm now sort of midway in my career. What do I want to do with the second half of my career? How am I going to enjoy that? I've got 20 years more until I'm at the Dutch retirement age. And I just want to have fun and do things that energize me. Not that the chemicals industry wasn't energizing me, but it was like such a reset. So the end of that tale is that I got to combine two things that I absolutely love. One is chemicals that I fell in love with, and the other one is the Salesforce technology. And then the rest is history. It has been history for six months because I haven't been with the company for very long. Yeah, interesting. And I guess the Salesforce platform and certainly the way it's evolved, because I remember Salesforce in the early days where it was a very 
simple and basic CRM, you know, SaaS model, which was new to the industry at that time, was pretty basic. And I know Salesforce has really extended what it does and how it reaches. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And they've bought a gazillion companies that provide them with a new technology. Company is 22 years old. And one of the things that if you ask me, so what's hindering you most in your role? And in my view, what is hindering this company most? It's that it is still seen as a CRM provider. While it is so much more than just CRM, it really is a low code or no code software platform. I often compare it to Lego where basically you can build anything you want with the technology that we provide. So one of the parts of my role that I currently have is to widen the aperture of our customers and our prospective customers to think differently, A, about technology and what that can unlock and unleash for your company, and B, then to also think wider of uh, Salesforce and think of everything that the company has to offer. Interesting. That's really interesting. So, I mean, it seems like it would be a pretty big shift going from an energy and chemical companies to Salesforce, which is a software and service company. What has really stood out about the company in terms of maybe what's different or even what's the same? Many things are actually the same. And then there are a couple of different things. So the things that are the same are the wonderful people that I work with. I've got great, talented, smart, driven colleagues in Salesforce, and I used to have those in Shell as well. What I also like is the, um, in Salesforce, they call it Ohana. In Shell Chemicals, I used to call it my family because there is that family feeling. You know the people, people are very supportive. So that has really not changed. I think Shell, by virtue of the size and longevity of the company, is much more structured. Maybe also because it was founded by engineers, and I can say a bit more about that if you like a bit later on. If you look at Salesforce, it is still very much a startup at heart. And that's been one of the things that I've had to adjust to. So th- the way that I went into the company was thinking, yeah, let me be, let me take the mindset of a researcher. Let me just be somebody who goes to a foreign tribe and tries to observe what is happening and make meaning of that. I figured before I started, that was a better way to experience this jump, then maybe to continuously compare, oh, but in Shell, we always used to do things like this, and now I have to do it like that. Mind you, if you talk to colleagues of mine now in Salesforce, they will probably say, yeah, but he does always (laughs) mention, oh, but in Shell, we did it this way. (laughs) That's natural. We all kind of make comparisons. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So as an anthropologist, which is how I now see myself, this startup mentality that Salesforce has is both a real strength of the company and it is also a bit of an Achilles heel because everybody is always ready to step up and help you with things. But it also means that sometimes actions are a bit more focused on the short term and getting things done now. And I hope that's where I and other people, because I'm not the only one who was hired out of an industry to go and work within Salesforce. There are more folks like me in the team that where I work. And we all take that experience of, well, maybe taking a bit of a longer view. There's a famous story of one of the Salesforce executives coming to Shell and one of the senior Shell executives thought they would start some small talk. And over coffee, they asked, so what are your plans for the next 10, 15 years? And the Salesforce exec goes completely white and then starts to explain, well, I'm really lucky if I know what's going to happen in 12 years. 18 months from now, all bets are off. That is the pace at which technology moves in the software industry. So I think I'm still getting to grips with how far ahead can we look, how far ahead Mm. must we look, and how much more in the moment do I need to be and just seize the opportunity as it comes. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. And and we'll get into it, but I think it's interesting because you obviously bring in that depth of expertise in the industry, which Salesforce needs to make its business more relatable and to be able to apply the innovations and the technology and the services that Salesforce brings to bear with what the chemical industry needs. And it's hard when you're working on two different timeframes, when pace means different things in different sides of the uh, equation. Yeah, it's hard. And at the same time, it's really, really interesting, like intellectually challenging. 
to be able to figure out, okay, how am I going to explain this concept to the person that I am sitting in front of today? How can I make sure what my colleagues are working on the technology side in Salesforce, that I translate that into concepts that are familiar to folks in the chemicals industry or in the oil and gas industry? Hmm. Yeah, I can see that it is a challenge, right? It's uh, different languages, so to speak, yeah, and different frames of reference. Which every industry has. So yeah. from that perspective, it's not alien at all. And personally, I take a lot of pride is, is the wrong word, but I get a lot of fun out of wrecking my brain over, okay, how am I going to explain this in a way that the other person not only understands it, but also accepts it as a view that they think, yeah, this sounds right. We'll be right back. At EcoVist, they're accelerating the transition to a sustainability-driven future. Their long history of innovation, expertise, and customer collaboration supports the development of proprietary catalysts and services across their two industry-leading businesses, Advanced Materials and Catalysts and EcoServices. Advanced Materials and Catalysts is a leader in proprietary and customized technologies for polymers, cleaner fuels, emissions control, and circularity. EcoServices is the largest North American recycler of spent sulfuric acid. EcoVist, your catalyst for positive change. All right, so I'm going to turn a little bit over to kind of just where a big part of your core of experience has been, which is around commercial excellence and then customer experience. And I've been talking with people on the podcast and outside the podcast with clients about this topic, but you've been focusing in this area for a long time. And what do you see as most critical? What makes it important and what's critical about it today? So I think if you look at the chemicals industry or maybe economy at large, for the last, and it depends a bit on when you start counting, you're familiar with the term super cycle, right? Where, yes. where we've actually, we've been in this up cycle for quite a long time, whether it's seven years or nine years, I won't debate that right now, but it's longer than anyone expected for this run. Um, typically what you see there is that means that everyone who invested, obviously you have all of your manufacturing challenges, your supply chain has hiccups, you need to fight for your customers. That's all true. But that really cutthroat environment that we had, for example, after the financial crisis, when we could almost literally hear the crackers sort of going, grinding, <laughs> literally grinding to a halt where you could hear the steel like ticking as it was cooling down, because all of a sudden, almost overnight, we had to reduce capacity in our industry. That kind of downturn we haven't seen for quite some time. And yes. the reason that I mentioned this is I think a lot of people who have been in commercial roles or who are now in leadership positions may not have experienced yet what that means. What that means- That's if you, true. Yeah. Yes. So when I was still in Shell, that was prior to the pandemic, we thought, okay, now it's going so well for this industry, there must be a downturn coming. And we actually themed it like Game of Thrones, winter is coming. And we talked about how do we prepare for that? What kind of scenarios can we already think through? And what kind of uh, playbooks can we put on the shelf that we can take off, dust off and start running with once it really happens? Yeah. Pandemic hit and everybody thought, oh, now this will be the end of demand. And the opposite happened. It actually meant that, for example, plastics were, and I think you even did one or two episodes on this, on how there was actually more demand than we thought. So now we're coming out of that. We have all kinds of supply chain disruptions. What we're seeing now is with the war in Ukraine, that energy prices are going up, raw materials prices are going up. And as a consequence, and I think on your last episode, you also spoke with somebody about that. We're now seeing that it is quite likely that some geographies will head into a recession. Yeah. Then, And that's really where the big litmus test will happen of who has gotten commercial excellence right. Because mm. if you haven't, you winter is really coming. If you have, if you've prepared for this, then you might actually now start to outcompete those competitors where earlier you were struggling to compete. 
Yeah. So I think it's, it's a fascinating time that's coming our way. And it makes me even more passionate about commercial excellence and the digital transformation that links to it. Yeah. So how do you see that tying together? How much of this transformation is digital or how much of customer or commercial excellence is digital? I would say all of it, but actually I'm biased, of course, <laughs> working just for a the little company. bit. Yeah. I think there's one other characteristic of the chemicals industry that I'd like to point to. You could pull it wider and say it's a process manufacturing industry, but typically in this industry, we make money by sweating the assets, right? Yes. Run hard, run full. That's how you maximize your margin. The effect of that is that many of these organizations are actually at the core, not customer centric, but asset centric. And that means I've often joked, we run a molecule evacuation organization. We created something, we produced the molecule. Let's get it out of the tank as quickly as we can. If we can get a great price, good, but we still need to clear the tank. So if we well, and I would say that we will. Yeah, absolutely. And that is certainly true of the majors. I think as you go deeper into the specialty companies, they value their product and Very margins true. and it's less asset and volume focused, although that's important, but it's more about how do they extract the value and the margin out of it. When I was at Shell, I sat in some conversations with people like, we have no idea how this company, this other company could make money given the number of people they have and the number of products they have. And then it's like, oh no. And then you flip over. And when I was at Clarion, it became more obvious. And then as I've consulted in with some other companies, it becomes much more obvious where a true marketing, right? And understanding product differentiation and product placement and customer experience differentiation, and that there's more than the product that's valuable. And that value comes not necessarily just in loading your assets. Very, very true. And that's actually, so that exactly what you just said there, that used to be my slogan. There are no commodity products, only commodity salespeople. (laughs) And there's always, always something that differentiates you from your competitor. And it may not be the molecule, but it can be everything around it. It can be your Mm -hmm. supply chain. It can be some of the services that you offer next to it. It can be the person that picks up the phone when you call to make an order. That could be your differentiator. And if you know what those differentiators are, if you're able to find that out, then you can also see, so what's the price elasticity? How much of a premium can I command for that thing that my customer values so much? Yeah. Interesting. Martin, you're singing my song. So how does that translate to Salesforce? Let's say the future belongs to those specialty chemicals companies that you spoke about earlier, right? Because it's their lifeline to understand how their products create value for their customers. So we're moving away a bit from the majors. And that's true probably for more of the chemicals industry, but we see a generational shift coming where you see some of the folks that have run the company for years are now starting to think about retirement. Younger people are coming up. And what's interesting is that that also creates a difference in buying behaviors because people are used to buy stuff online in their personal lives. When I was still with Shell selling my Salesforce implementation, I would ask people, which of you uh, sometimes buy something online? And all hands would go up. And then I would ask, so who of you is able to control the temperature of their house here from this room? And some more hands would go up. So who can switch on the lights on their mobile phone? And some hands would go up. Who can operate their alarm system from here? And hands would go up. I said, so then why is it that when you walk in here into this building and you switch on your computer, you find it acceptable that we take you back to 1985. Because if you think of the ERP user interface, I'm not talking about the functionality, it's brilliant at what it does. But if you look at the user interface, it is just not the way that we're yeah. used to working with apps and websites, etc. Absolutely. But what you see is that those people that are now coming through the ranks in this industry, they expect that. So if you as a company are unable to either give that to your customers simply because you haven't had the need to invest in it, or even scarier, with the skill shortage and the labor shortage that we see around the world in different markets, if you're not able to compete for talent because they think, well, hmm, here I have this really clunky user interface that they make we work with, and there I have something that is much closer to what I'm used to in my daily life, then guess what they will choose? So it becomes a bit of an imperative that you have a 
user experience and a customer experience that is very close to what we often refer to as consumer grade, what you would expect when you go on the market as a consumer to buy something. And this is where I believe Salesforce is uniquely positioned to deliver that, deliver it fast. So low time to value, make it really quick and snap. You open the box, you start configuring it and it just works Mm. because that's what the company was founded on 22 years ago. And I think that those companies that invest in that, so they will have a bigger chance of winning, competing in the market. At the same time, and this is again, you will like this because it plays into commercial excellence. But if you think of your own company, we didn't sort of script this. So bear with me here and we'll cut this out if it somehow doesn't fit. But when you started Progressio, did you start with some kind of CRM? No, but I moved to one somewhat quicker than an established company would have said. (laughs) Yeah, but no, I didn't. And then I pretty quickly realized I needed something. So that's exactly where I was going. Why did you feel you needed? Well, at the end of the day, it comes to having everything all in one place, being able to visualize what I'm doing with my clients, being able to have clarity and tracking and analytics. And I don't need super powerful stuff. It's not like I'm serving millions of customers, but it was that. I will tell you though, also Martine, part of it was because I felt like I had to. Like I had Mm -hmm. a certain base of experience where I said, okay, at some point you need a CRM system. This is just what you need. And then of course, CRMs today do so many things and certainly for a small business at a very low price point. And I think this is something that I see with loads of customers. So that was the real aha for me when I joined Salesforce, I got to look in many different kitchens. And what you see is that many companies actually, they do have a CRM, they've invested in that. But then if you look at how people actually collaborate, they still put stuff in spreadsheets and then yeah. they email it to each other or visit reports, get typed up in Word or some other application and stored on a hard drive. And that sort of has a risk because if the person leaves or God forbid something terrible happens, you don't have access to that information anymore. But it also slows down your pace of collaboration and your pace of innovation. I'll give you an example. When I was still at Shell, and Shell was also rolling out these circular molecules. So take used plastic, put it through a pyrolysis unit, clean it up, pyrolysis oil goes into the cracker. You know the drill. Right, your right, right. Well. advanced recycling. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But then when you start thinking about, so who do we want to sell this to? Normally, what would have happened was that we would have to do a survey with sellers. Do you know anyone who might be interested? Now, because all of those visit reports were actually in our Salesforce instance, we could just do text mining. And we looked for words Mm. like green, renewable, circular, sustainability, sustainable, and out came all of the customers where these words popped up in the visit reports. If you store everything in your mail program, whether it's Outlook or Google Mail or on your hard drive, You might be able to get to it with today's search functionality, but it will be infinitely more difficult. So I think when I started asking you, so why did you ultimately start with CRM? The answer that I expect is, well, things start falling through the cracks if I don't sort of compile it and track it and all the things you said. And I think that's usually where it starts, but I would call that a first order effect of your investment where the music's really playing and where you will get a lot of ROI of your investment is the second and third order effects. And those are the things like this text mining that I just uh, Mm. spoke about or other use cases that you unlock by making that initial investment. How does that tie in then to commercial excellence and the customer experience? So let's start with commercial excellence. Suppose you have a molecule that can go to 10 different customers. And as it usually goes in the chemicals industry, you have finite supply in any given month. Right. How do you then decide which customer actually gives you the biggest benefit, the biggest margin? Well, that you could probably still run on a spreadsheet, but if you add some extra layers of complexity... So when is my next contract negotiation with this customer coming up? Or are they in the market for more? How many opportunities do I have with these customers? And does that change the choice that I would make? 
When you add those levels of complexity, that's when where I think digital and commercial excellence start to hit each other. Because with the current state of technology, it is really, really easy to visualize those kind of dimensions of a larger data set. That's not rocket science at all anymore. It's quite difficult if you want to do it in a spreadsheet. But if you use tools that are slightly more advanced, it's a lot easier. And if you do it on a platform, for example, the Salesforce platform, it's really easy to take data from different parts of your system and combine that. So that, for example, you don't only know what's my net back on this customer, how much margin do I make on this molecule to this set of customers, but you can also pull in, well, where do I have other opportunities? And can I tie this into my negotiation? Can I command a premium? Because I can tell this customer, look, I'll give you this molecule now, but then you have to promise me that you're also going to buy that and that molecule from me. To me, making those kind of package deals or leverage all of the negotiables that you have, that is commercial excellence. And that is ideally powered by digital because the technology is out there today to enable that. Yeah. Interesting. So in your role today, you are engaging, is it primarily chemical companies across the industry really to just better use these digital tools um, with their customers? Mm -hmm. What are the barriers, right? I mean, so it'd be easy to say, oh, everybody gets that, everybody gets it, that this is where the world is going. And yet we know there's barriers. I mean, I talked to many companies who aren't embracing digital. Yeah, maybe they have components of it. They're not fully tied together. When you implement a system, change management is huge, right? Exactly. At times, yeah. I've had people say, well, it's all going to be better when we get X. Well, yeah. the system, whatever it is, is not the magic pill. It's the fact that people actually have to engage with it and put the information in, extract the information out, et cetera. But what are you seeing when you go out and you're talking to customers? Are they receptive to this? Are they skeptical? Where are the barriers? Yeah, well, first of all, I very much agree with what you just mentioned. I always refer to it, if you build it, they will come. That that quote from a movie. Many people think that way. And to be honest, I'll probably be stepping on a couple of toes here, but a lot of the people in this industry are engineers, so they love technology. And they think, if I've built this system, then indeed my life will be better. And they forget that there's a human and a behavioral element. I could talk for hours on that. Maybe we can touch on it later. (laughs) But I think so users and pulling users along on your journey, that's definitely a barrier. Very often people talk about the customer experience, but I always try to explain that there's a yin and yang, a dark and light that cannot exist without each other. So the customer experience is the flip side of the coin that is the user experience. And you need to get both right if you want to be successful with your digital transformation. The second thing is probably that specifically in leadership levels, people have grown up, engineers have grown up with building assets. And I've had these conversations with many clients as well, where physical assets, they are completely comfortable to make a back of the envelope calculation and say, yeah, if we put in a heat exchanger of that size, And maybe we use this kind of steel for the pipes. And then the furnace need to have that dimension. They can do it all in their mind. And they also know, oh, here I have to look out because this decision that I make may have repercussions for later the bottlenecks or operational availability of my kit, et cetera. Really, really comfortable. Then we go to digital asset, creating a software platform. And suddenly all of that comfort goes away because they see Mm. the cost They very often approach it as a one and done investment. Oh, I put this money in now. And then for the next five to 10 years, I never have to look at it. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. It doesn't work like that in your plant, actually, because you still need maintenance. Right. We like to ignore that part of it. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. But still, then when you start it up, it comes to bite you, right? (laughs) It needs a layer of paint. You need to look for corrosion. You name it. So I think... This is something that I'm trying to almost evangelize to people that you have to, if you think about this investment that you're making in a digital platform, think of it as a digital asset where all of the normal CapEx management Mm -hmm. type of practices come into play. It's also, it's pipes, it's heat exchangers. We just call them differently. 
they all have their little intricacies. And it also means that some of the decisions that you make in your journey by saying, okay, let me not invest in this right now, may actually mean that they build what we call technical debt. So stuff that you then have to fix later on. If yeah. you have a really good systems integrator or a rock star IT team, they will guide you through that process. But unfortunately, I also see a lot of companies where this becomes an exercise where they rip all of the investment proposals apart with such scrutiny that ultimately it leads to stagnation. And people continue to debate, yeah, what do we really need it? How much yeah. does it cost? Well, and so what I think is interesting about it, Martin, is that it's hard for chemical companies and chemical executives who are used to saying, oh, if I add this heat exchanger, I'm going to get 10% more capacity or 24th, whatever the number is that they're using. They see a ready translation to more, more volume, more dollars, more, right? Yeah. Whereas often when we talk about systems and tools, digital tools, whether it Mm -hmm. be a portal to allow your customers to buy product and get access and whatever, they don't actually see an ROI because, well, am I actually going to make more sales? I think this presumption is, is it, they don't necessarily understand the value of the customer experience, right? And Mm -hmm. tying that all together and what customers expect and will find easier. They don't necessarily see that there will be an opportunity to create more value and maybe even more customer stickiness and heck, employee stickiness. Because as you say, the user experience is the flip side of the coin there from the customer experience. And then I think maybe there's a view and it's not expressed and maybe it's just a bias that people are cheap and that making it easier may not actually have value. Because again, I already have a team. I already have a team of salespeople and business people and customer service people and whomever, and they're doing fine right now. I don't necessarily see the value of investing in a system that makes it easier for those people because business is going okay. Yep. And I think, so then we're almost full circle to where we started. Yeah. In the last seven to nine years, you could get away with that. Mm. And maybe, be my guest, try if in this new era, you can still get away with it. I think at some point you will find that you then need to make sort of a jump to, so if you consider this to a road cycling race, I don't know if that's maybe not such a big sports ever since Lance Armstrong. (laughs) (laughs) We have global listeners. People recognize it. It's a good analogy. Let me take Formula One. Maybe even better. So if you're Max Verstappen, obviously I need to mention his name being Dutch, but if you're Max Verstappen, you're always in the front of the race. But if you drive for Williams or for Haas, how are you going to get there towards the front of the race? If you're not even anymore in the pack in the middle, but you're always lagging behind, the effort that it will take for you to get back to the pack, Mm -hmm. and I'm not even talking about getting to the front of the race, The effort and thus the investment, that's your financial incentive, is exponentially bigger than if you're able to hang on to midfield, to the pack. And I think that's something that is often discounted. But again, everybody's entitled to their own ideas and maybe Mm -hmm. mistakes. But I'd love to talk to those executives in five years and see, so how has that served for you trying to ignore the digital transformation that all of society is going through. There's another podcaster besides you. I'm sorry. It's okay. I I I listen listen to a variety of podcasts. It's good. So somebody that I admire hugely and I listen a lot to, and if he were on public radio, most of his podcasts would be beeped because he uses a lot of profanities. But Christopher Lockhead, he has this concept. Do you know him? Have you? No, I'll have to go look him up. I definitely recommend also to all of your audience. He has a number of different podcasts. And he also has a newsletter that he sends, which is called Category Pirates. And with the writers of that newsletter, he started coining the concept of digital natives and analog natives. Mm. And I find that very interesting because I see the shift happening and it ties into what I talked about earlier, the generational shift that we now see coming. So digital natives are those people that are now 30 to 35 and under. They have always had smartphones, tablets, computers in their lives from the moment that they were born. And I yes. see it with my kids. When, when <laughs> they, too. 
<laughs> barely able to walk or speak, but they could already operate the iPad. And you see it with your kids. You probably also, if you're a little bit like me, because I think we have roughly the same age, you go on holiday and they're on their phones the whole freaking day. Well, and then my you probably oldest, call them I, out on it. It's okay. I still remember my daughter, the first one that got a phone and she got a smartphone mm-hmm. because that was the age that she was getting it. And I remember saying like, if I knew that you were never going to actually make a phone call, why did I get you a phone? And my kids literally have the phone icon buried. Like if I'm trying to borrow somebody's phone to make a phone call because my phone is someplace, I'm like, can you please pull up your phone? Because I can't find it because they don't use the phone. They use all the other technologies, whether it be FaceTime or something else to make connections. And yeah, I mean, they are digital natives, no doubt. So this is interesting because what that means is that they experience the world from a digital perspective first, whereas you and I are more analog natives. We experience the world in a different way. And that has all kinds of really profound effects on society, on digital transformation, on this generational shift. So how do you get your company, your organization ready for both customers and employees that are digital natives? You also see it playing out in the war in Ukraine now. This was something that he, in one of his newsletters, one of his articles pointed out, and I thought that was fascinating. On the one side, you have Putin, who is restricting access and trying to control the narrative, doesn't understand that he cannot because people will install VPNs and they will still get access to news, etc., specifically the younger crowd. The older people only watch television, so they get all of the propaganda, but the younger crowd doesn't, and that's the future of his country. He also doesn't say much publicly about how he feels about the war. And then you have on the other side, Zelensky, who from day one started doing vlogs in the street, communicating. And I think all of the support that we now see for Ukraine, a lot of it is because, yeah, truly heartfelt, we feel like, They're on the good side of history, and we want to be with them on the good side of history. But why do we feel like that? Because he approached war in a completely digital fashion. He communicated about it so completely opposite to his opponent. And I think we'll need more time, space, and distance, and some historians who are able to look at at sources in 10 or 15 years from now. But I think one of the conclusions might be that this is, this is what won Ukraine the war, because they were able to harness that global support with the use of digital technology. And the other folks on the other side of the conflict of the war, the invaders, they did it old fashioned. They did it the analog way. And I think we're seeing that analog doesn't work anymore yeah. or only yeah, for a, a certain of- generation. No, that's right. I mean, some disruptive innovations. We're at a disruption point, if you will, right? An inflection point yeah. in society, but also in the industry, right? I mean, it, it all kind of follows and flows in terms of how people learn, use, and engage with new technologies and what it means to the future. And that's what I urge customers. You don't have to buy Salesforce products, but think about How are you going to be successful in this new world, in this digital first world, selling to and hiring digital natives? If you take anything away from this podcast, just think through, how are you going to do that with your organization? And yeah, from there on out, you can start plotting the rest of your corporate strategy, but this should be a really important part of it. Mm, That's right. I think that's awesome. And that may actually be a good wrapping point for us because we've gone quite a long. We have a lot more to talk about. I think I'm going to have to have you back on so that we can continue the conversation. And we probably have a few more conversational tracks to follow. But I think this, your point of thinking about how do you invest for your digital natives of the future is critical. I totally agree. And I yeah. would love to come back, uh, Victoria. Awesome. I really enjoyed this. Thank you for Yeah, this me. has been great. Well, thank you for joining us today, Martine. This has been super and you've given us a few suggestions. We will link into the show notes so that people can find it. And I appreciate you joining the chemical show today. Pleasure was entirely mine. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. And thanks everybody for listening and like, listen, follow and share. We'll see you next time. We've come to the end of today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time with us and want to learn more. 
simply visit thechemicalshow.com for additional information and helpful resources. Join us again next time here on The Chemical Show with Victoria Meyer.